Mama Russell L. Healy is presiding. Please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices at this time. The use of cell phones, cell phone cameras, photographic, recording, or electronic devices of any kind is absolutely prohibited. <clears throat> and they must be turned off while court is in session. Credential representatives of the media who have gained approval from the court may use laptops, iPads, and tablets provided. However, they are not to be used for photographic and or recording purposes. There will be no talking while court is in session. For justice to be served, the jury must be able to stay focused on the court proceedings. Therefore, talking or disruptive behavior by anyone in the audience will not be tolerated. A violation of any of these rules will result in you being removed from the courtroom. Now you may be serious. Kim, can you staple those for me too? Sorry, they're easier. But... All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> before we begin, we need to discuss the alternate jurors and what we are going to do um, with them. The uh, last time we actually had the alternate jurors uh, continue to be sequestered for a period of time, and so the question again comes up as to whether or not to do that. It turned out it wasn't necessary that we needed an alternate. And quite frankly, the rule in some of the case law conflicts on what you could or couldn't do with an alternate. Uh, so, Ms. Hanania, have you had a chance to speak to Mr. Dunn about whether or not to continue to hold on to the alternates, keep them sequestered so that in the event something were to happen to one of the 12 jurors, uh, we could substitute an alternate for one of the 12 if something were to happen. Your Honor, I have had the opportunity to speak with Mr. Dunn on that issue. Um, it's our position that the rule requires the discharge of alternate jurors at the moment that uh, our actual juror, jury is um, sent in to deliberate, and that would be our position as to what Your Honor should do. All right, Mr. Dunn, raise your right hand for me, please, sir. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth help you, God? I do. All right. And so you've had that conversation with Ms. Hanania about the alternate jurors? Yes, Your Honor. And it's your desire that I discharge these alternate jurors as soon as I send the 12 back to begin to deliberate? Yes, sir. And you understand if there's something were to happen to one of the 12 jurors, then, and they could not continue for whatever reason, uh, then in essence we would have a mistrial. I understand. You understand that there is a slight possibility, um, at least in my reading of the cases, that potentially the appellate court would agree that if something happened to one of the 12, and if we continued to keep the jurors, the alternate jurors, sequestered, we could perhaps substitute one of those in for the, the one that something happened to and have the deliberations begin anew and then it would still potentially be a lawful verdict. Do you understand that's a possibility, at least in my mind? And yes, I could sir. be wrong. I mean, I'm not the appellate court. you understand yes, sir. that that could happen? Whether the appellate court would say that was uh, a lawful verdict or not, we don't really no, but you don't want to opt to even go that route. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Corey? Your Honor, I believe that what the rule contemplates with regard to discharge of alternates is ministerial, not substantive. I don't believe that rule ever contemplate in a situation in a case such as this where the <coughs> court and the taxpayers have gone to such great lengths to sequester alternates to make sure the defendant's due process rights to a fair trial are safeguarded. I think that's the entire purpose of what this court has done so diligently and so painstakingly for the second time now to make sure Mr. Dunn gets a fair trial. 
I believe that that rule just doesn't address a situation like this. I don't believe they ever contemplated so-called high-profile trials and the ramifications if an alternate were to get sick. And that is a true possibility. I've tried a death case in another county before where that very thing happened. If the alternate stay sequestered, as this court, again, has so painstakingly done, there can be no harm or taint to the alternates. Then that only leaves the question as to whether or not this court, if a juror would be, become ill or get disqualified for another reason, how the court would then bring the group back together, replace an alternate on the panel, and then instruct them on their deliberations. I believe that would be the only question remaining. <coughs> if this court clearly instructs the new panel to forget everything they've said in that room and go back and start over, I believe that would satisfy every due process concern that there is. And because the case law only addresses situations where alternates will be not kept sequestered so carefully. First of all, they weren't kept sequestered at all, much less as carefully as this court has done in this case. I think that that would withstand any review on appeal, and we're asking the court to keep these alternates sequestered, but of course we understand the court's position because I don't believe the case law does give us clear direction on what to do. I would also think that it would be time for somebody to look at this rule and uh, you know the criminal rules of procedure and the rules of judicial administration and, and address issues like this in cases such as this. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Corey. Um, Rule 3.280 addresses alternate jurors and indicates that um, an alternate juror who does not replace a principal juror shall be discharged at the same time the jury retires to consider its verdict. Sounds pretty straightforward. I'm not sure when that uh, rule was written, but <clears throat> Among other cases, for the record, there's a case of uh, Williams versus State at 792 Southern 2nd, 1207, which talks about uh, a situation where an alternate juror was placed uh, into the jury room to replace a juror. The problem there was that alternate juror had not been continued to be sequestered. They had been discharged and I think the language in the uh, in the case is they were released back into the community, and uh, in one of the opinions, the and this was the Supreme Court of Florida. They indicated that they had sympathy for the trial court in that case because they had had a long trial and the jurors had been deliberating for in that case, only about four hours uh, when the one juror could not continue. But they go on to say that the uh, Constitution guarantees uh, obviously a trial by a jury and once the jury process is broken down, as they say, as it did there, it could not be put back together again by simply discharging the troubled juror and substituting a previously discharged alternate and therein, therein lies the language of previously discharged alternate. Uh, they, the court there says once there's a breakdown of that type to the integrity of a 12-person jury and that that 12-person jury has been disturbed, they have no choice but to begin anew, meaning a mistrial would have to be declared and, and a trial uh, begin again. It didn't really, and, and maybe now that I've mentioned it, I hope we don't jinx ourselves, but it didn't become an issue the last time. Um, the only thing I might consider doing is I would release two of the three and keep one, at least for the day. Um, but the only th worry I have is once it's over the defendant's objection, I, I just don't know that appellate court's going to going to go with it. Um, Although, I just, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, because I want to do a little bit more research if I can, 
I'll discharge two and keep one. That way it's easy to keep them separate because otherwise they'd have to keep all three separate from one another. And we'll keep one for a little while today while I continue to do some additional research and then we can address it a little bit later. It won't be that big of an inconvenience to the one. And uh, later today, depending on what how things go, I may we'll revisit it and I may discharge the one, depending on what else I find uh, in the case law. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the way we'll handle that. Um, so for the bailiffs, when I finish with the jury instructions, I'll need the uh, three alternates to get their belongings. Um, <coughs> and then uh, number 14 will remain and uh, I don't know if something's going on in, in the jury room in 405 or not. There is. There is. Okay, well then we'll take that juror to the jury room in 305. And then the other two, uh, they just need to go to the courtroom in 305. So I can, I'll just thank them for their service and talk, talk to them about getting them back to their vehicles. They're getting their belongings and they're going home and remind them uh, not to discuss anything about the case until the case is concluded. So that's the way we'll handle that, okay? Any objection to that from the state? Yes, sir. Any objection from the defense to no, that? Yeah. Okay. All right, then. Uh, we can bring the jurors on. <clears throat> Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Uh, sorry about the little delay. We had a few last minute things with the jury instructions I had to get cleaned up because I've got copies for all of you. You all can have a seat. Uh, <clears throat> I've got copies for all of you that you'll be able to get back into the jury room. Um, so I want to make sure that they were in proper order. Uh, so that's what took us a little bit of time. Again, welcome back and good morning to you. Let me again thank you for your time and attention during the last week and a half and uh, ask you to continue to pay close attention to the jury instructions that I'm now about to read to you. The defendant, Michael Dunn, in this case, has been accused of the crime of murder in the first degree. Murder in the first degree includes the lesser uh, crimes of murder in the second degree and manslaughter, all of which are unlawful. A killing that is excusable or was committed by the use of justifiable deadly force is lawful. If you find Jordan Davis was killed by Michael Dunn, you will then consider the circumstances surrounding the killing in deciding if the killing was murder in the first degree or was murder in the second degree or was manslaughter or whether the killing was excusable or resulted from justifiable use of deadly force. The killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the killing. The killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. One, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune in doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent. Or two, when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation. Or three, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat if a dangerous weapon is not used 
and the killing is not done in a cruel and unusual manner. Dangerous weapon is any weapon that, taking into account the manner in which it is used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. I will now instruct you on the circumstances that must be proved before Michael Dunn may be found guilty of murder in the first degree or any lesser included crime. To prove the crime of first degree premeditated murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, Jordan Davis is dead. Two, the death was caused by the criminal act of Michael Dunn. Three, there was a premeditated killing of Jordan Davis. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass between the formation of the premeditated intent to kill and the killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. The question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you from the evidence. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. If you find that Michael Dunn committed murder in the first degree and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Jordan Davis, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree with discharge of a firearm causing death. If you find that Michael Dunn committed murder in the first degree and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree with discharge of a firearm. If you find that the defendant committed murder in the first degree and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree with actual possession of a firearm. A firearm is legally defined as any weapon which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. To actually possess a firearm means that the defendant carried a firearm on his person or had a firearm within immediate physical reach with ready access with the intent to use the firearm during the commission of the crime. In considering the evidence, you should consider the possibility that although the evidence may not convince you that the defendant committed the main crime of which he is accused, there may be evidence that he committed other acts that would constitute a lesser included crime. Therefore, if you decide that the main accusation has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you will next need to decide if the defendant is guilty of any lesser included crime. The lesser included crimes uh, indicated in the definition of murder in the first degree are murder in the second degree and manslaughter. To prove the crime of second degree murder, the state must prove the following three elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, Jordan Davis is dead. Second, the death was caused by the criminal act of Michael Dunn. Third, there was an unlawful killing of Jordan Davis by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act includes a series of related actions arising from and performed pursuant to a single design or purpose. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another and is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent and is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. In order to convict of second degree murder, it is not necessary for the state to prove the defendant had an intent to cause death. 
If you find that Michael Dunn committed murder uh, in the second degree and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he discharged a firearm and in doing so caused the death of Jordan Davis, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree with discharge of a firearm causing death. If you find that Michael Dunn committed murder in the second degree and you also find from a, if you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he discharged a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second degree murder with discharge of a firearm. If you find that Michael Dunn committed second degree murder and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he actually possessed a firearm, you should find the defendant guilty of second degree murder with actual possession of a firearm. <coughs> a firearm is legally defined as any weapon which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. To actually possess a firearm means that the defendant carried a firearm, firearm on his person or had a firearm within immediate physical reach with ready access with the intent to use the firearm during the commission of the crime. To, to prove the crime of manslaughter, the state must prove the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, Jordan Davis is dead. Second, Michael Dunn intentionally committed an act or acts that caused the death of Jordan Davis. The defendant cannot be guilty of manslaughter by committing a merely negligent act or if the killing was either justifiable or excusable homicide. Each of us has a duty to act reasonably toward others. If there is a violation of that duty without any conscious intent to harm, that violation is negligence. The killing of a human being is justifiable homicide and lawful if necessarily done while resisting an attempt to murder or commit a felony upon the defendant or to commit a felony in any dwelling house in which the defendant was at the time of the killing. The killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. When the killing is committed by accident and misfortune in doing any lawful act by lawful means with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent. Or when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion upon any sudden and sufficient provocation. Or when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, if a dangerous weapon is not used and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. In order to convict of manslaughter by act, it is not necessary for the state to prove that the defendant had an intent to cause death, only an intent to commit an act that was not merely negligent, justified, or excusable, and which caused death. If you find that Michael Dunn committed manslaughter and you also find beyond a reasonable doubt that during the commission of the crime he used a firearm, you should find him guilty of manslaughter with a firearm. A firearm, again, is legally defined as any weapon which will, is designed to, or may readily be converted to expel a projectile by the action of an explosive. If you find only that Michael Dunn committed manslaughter but did not use a firearm, then you should find him guilty of only manslaughter. An issue in this case is whether Michael Dunn acted in self-defense. It is a defense to murder in the first degree, the crime with which Michael Dunn is charged, and the lesser included offenses, which I previously indicated to you are second degree murder and manslaughter, if the death of Jordan Davis resulted from the justifiable use of deadly force. Deadly force means force likely to cause death or great bodily harm. The use of deadly force is justifiable if Michael Dunn reason reasonably believes that the force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself while resisting another's attempt to murder him or another or any attempt to commit aggravated assault, aggravated battery, or attempted murder upon him or another. And any, or any attempt to commit aggravated assault, aggravated battery, or attempted murder upon or in any vehicle occupied by him. An assault is an intentional, unlawful threat by word or act to do violence to the person of another, coupled with an apparent ability to do, to do so, 
and doing some act which creates a well-founded fear in such other person that such violence is imminent. An aggravated assault is an assault with a deadly weapon without intent to kill or with an intent to commit a felony. A battery is when a person actually and intentionally touches or strikes another person against the will of the other or intentionally causes bodily harm to another person. An aggravated battery is a battery which intentionally or knowingly causes great bodily harm, permanent disability, permanent disfigurement, or uses a deadly weapon. A deadly weapon is an item which, when used in the ordinary manner contemplated by its design, will or is likely to cause death or great bodily harm, or any instrument likely to cause great bodily harm because of the way it is used. Murder in the first degree is the unlawful killing of a human being when perpetrated from a premeditated design to affect the death of the person killed or any human being or when committed by a person engaged in the perpetration of or in the attempt to perpetrate any murder of another human being. Murder in the second degree is the unlawful killing of a human being when perpetrated by any act imminently dangerous to another and evincing a depraved mind regardless of human life, although without any premeditated design to affect the death of any particular individual or in the attempt to perpetrate any murder of another human being. Michael Dunn is justified in using deadly force if he reasonably, reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or another. The imminent commission of aggravated assault, aggravated battery, attempted murder, or murder against himself or another. I have previously defined aggravated assault, aggravated battery, murder in the first degree, and murder in the second degree as they relate to justifiable use of deadly force. In deciding whether Michael Dunn was justified in the use of deadly force, you must judge him by the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time the force was used. The danger facing Michael Dunn need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person under the same circumstances would have believed that the danger could not could that the danger could of could be avoided only through the use of that force based upon appearances michael dunn must have actually believed that the danger was real if michael dunn was not engaged in an unlawful activity and was attacked in any place where he had a right to be he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force, if he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another, or to prevent the commission of a forcible felony. A forcible felony is an aggravated assault, aggravated battery, attempted murder, or murder in the first degree, or murder in the second degree as it relates to this case. Again, I have previously defined for you uh, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, murder in the first degree, murder, and murder in the second degree as they relate to justifi justifiable use of deadly force. In considering the issue of self-defense, you may take into account the relative physical abilities and capabilities of Michael Dunn and Jordan Davis. If, in your consideration of the issue of self-defense, you have a reasonable doubt on the question of whether Michael Dunn was justified in the use of deadly force, you should find Michael Dunn not guilty. However, if from the evidence you are convinced that Michael Dunn was not justified in the use of deadly force, you should find him guilty if all the elements of the charge have been proved. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment through each stage of the trial unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. 
To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It's to the evidence introduced in this trial and to it alone that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. The state must prove that the crime was committed on November the 23rd, 2012. It must also be proved, but only to a reasonable certainty, that the alleged crime was committed in Duval County. It's up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or, re or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some additional things to consider are, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Does the witness's testimony agree with other testimony and other evidence in the case? Has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? Has the witness been convicted of a felony? Whether the state has met its burden of proof does not depend on the number of witness, witnesses it has called or upon the number of exhibits it has offered, but instead upon the nature and quality of the evidence presented. The fact that a witness is employed in law enforcement does not mean that his or her testimony deserves more or less consideration than that of any other witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert witness's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe he or she to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. The defendant in this case has become a witness. You should apply the same rules to the consideration of his testimony that you apply to the testimony of other witnesses. It is entirely proper for a lawyer to have spoken to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by having spoken to a lawyer about his or her testimony prior to coming to the courtroom. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the credibility of any witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. Statements claimed to have been made by the defendant outside of court have been placed before you. Such statements should always be considered with great caution and be weighed with great care to make certain that they were freely and voluntarily made. Therefore, you must determine from the evidence that the defendant's alleged statements were knowingly, voluntarily, and freely made. In making this determination, you should consider the total circumstances, including but not limited to, whether when the defendant made the statements, he had been threatened in order to get him to make the statement, and whether anyone had promised him anything in order to get him to make the statement. If you conclude that the defendant's out-of-court statements were not freely and voluntarily made, you should disregard them. Next are some general rules that will apply to your deliberations and discussions. These rules must be followed in order to return a lawful verdict. 
You must follow the law as set out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict would be a miscarriage of justice. There's no reason for failing to follow the law in this case, and we're all depending upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. This case must be decided only upon the evidence that you have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of exhibits in evidence and from these instructions. This case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. Remember also the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them should not influence your decision in this case. Your duty is to determine if the defendant has been proven guilty or not in accord with the law. It is my job to determine a proper sentence if the defendant is ultimately found guilty. Whatever verdict you render must be unanimous, that is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. Your verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. Your verdict must be based on the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. Deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please also disregard anything I might have done or said that would make you think I prefer one verdict over another. During the trial, you've been allowed to take notes. You'll be allowed to take those notes with you into the jury room uh, to use during your deliberations. Please remember, though, your notes are a tool to aid you in your individual memory. You should not compare your notes with those of other jurors in determining the content of any testimony or in evaluating the importance of any evidence. Notes are for the note taker's personal use in refreshing his or her recollection of the evidence. The notes themselves are not evidence. Above all, your memory should be your greatest asset in your recollection of the evidence. You may find the defendant guilty as charged in the indictment or guilty of a lesser included offense uh, as the evidence may justify or not guilty. If you return a verdict of guilty, it should be for the highest offense which has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that no offense has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, then of course your verdict must be not guilty. Only one verdict may be returned as to the crime charged. This verdict, as I said, must be unanimous. That is, that is all of you must agree to the same verdict. The verdict has to be in writing, and so for that uh, purpose we have prepared um, verdict forms for you. Did somebody grab them? Here they are. Uh, if I could have the bailiff hand those out to the jurors. I want to go over those with you quickly um, so you'll have one there to look at while I go over it with you um, so you'll understand the verdict form. It's really pretty simple and pretty self-explanatory, but let's just go over it here. Um, at the top, it says the state of Florida versus Michael David Dunn. Off to the right at the top, it has a case number and a division assignment. And then in the middle of the page, it says verdict. And you can see off to the sides, it, it says one. And there's a line there for you to put a check or an X mark in. The first line reads, we the jury find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. If that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there, but you're not finished because you have to make some sub-findings. So you'll drop down and you'll see the next line reads, if you find the defendant guilty of this offense, you must choose one of the following findings. The first one reads, we find that the defendant discharged a firearm causing death during the commission of the offense. If that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. If not, you drop down to the next line, which reads, we find that the defendant discharged a firearm during the commission of the offense. Obviously, the difference is there it says discharge, and the other one it says dis discharge and causing death. So if that second choice is your verdict, you put a sec uh, check or an X mark there. If not, you drop down to the third line. We find the defendant actually possessed but did not discharge a firearm during the commission of the offense. 
If that were your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. And then the fourth line, we find that the defendant did not actually possess or discharge a firearm during the commission of the offense. If that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. If you did not believe that uh, the defendant had been uh, found guilty of, or you did not find him guilty of first degree murder, then you're going to look to the lesser included offenses. And that's when you drop down to number two. The first lesser included offense to consider is second degree murder. And so it says, we the jury find the defendant guilty of second degree murder, a lesser included offense. If that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. And then again, you have to make the same sub-findings. They all read the same there, so I won't go over them with you again, but you have to consider each one and, and, and check whichever one is your finding. If you did not believe that the defendant had committed second-degree murder, then the next uh, consideration would be number three, another lesser-included offense. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of manslaughter, a lesser-included offense. If you believe that were the case, you put a, and that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. Then there are only two sub-findings, and it says uh, if you find the defendant guilty of this lesser-included offense, you must consider one of the following findings. The first one, we find that the defendant did use a firearm during the commission of the offense. If that's your decision, you put a check or an X mark there. If not, you'd consider the next line, we find that the defendant did not use a firearm during the commission of defense. If that's your decision, a check or an X mark there. If none of those things did you believe were proven, then line number four, we the jury find the defendant not guilty. If that's your verdict, you put a check or an X mark there. Then you can see it says, so say we all, which means it's unanimous, done at Jacksonville, Duval County, Florida, and there's a place for the four person to sign it and date it. It must be signed and it must be dated by the four person. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to allow you to go into the jury room and almost be ready to deliberate your verdict. Before you begin your deliberations, the first thing I need you to do is to select a foreperson. It could be any one of you. It doesn't matter who it is. And that person would then preside over your deliberations, much like a chairperson would preside uh, over a meeting. Um, when you have uh, reached a verdict, if you haven't seen it already, the bailiffs will show it to you. There is a buzzer on the inside of the jury room door. You will press that button. It makes a sound here in the courtroom, and then the bailiffs will knock on the door and ask if you've reached a verdict. Assuming that you have, then the bailiff will close the door. You'll remain in the room, and the bailiff will come out and find me. Uh, we have to gather the attorneys back. And again, just like the trial, when the verdict is rendered, it has to be here in the courtroom, in your presence, my presence, the attorneys, and the defendant. So it may take a bit of time to get everybody gathered back together. Um, so if you're in there for a few minutes after you've reached your verdict, that's the situation. If you need to communicate with me um, during your deliberations, you can send a note, should be from the foreperson, a written note, and you would uh, again ask the bailiff to, to deliver the note. And if you have questions, then I will talk to the attorneys before I answer them. Um, and so that could take some time, and, but you can continue, continue your deliberations while you're waiting for the answer, uh, and then I will answer the question if I can, either in writing or orally here in the courtroom. Sometimes we just bring you back into the courtroom and uh, I address the matter from there. Uh, again, your verdict uh, finding the defendant either guilty or not guilty must be unanimous. The verdict must be the verdict of each juror as well as the jury as a whole. During the trial, obviously, items have been received into evidence as, as exhibits, and you may examine whatever exhibits you think would be helpful in your deliberations. Uh, while we have been in here, we have been placing all the exhibits in the jury room. Uh, it might make it a little bit more cramped because some of those things are in big boxes, but all the evidence will be in there. You will also have a computer in there uh, so that if there's a disc that you need to look at or play, you can do that. And we have a large screen, 55-inch, um, I think it is, screen TV-like, so that you can all see what's on the, um, what's coming on, off the computer. So you wouldn't just have to look at one small computer screen because that could be difficult for all 12 of you. So we've put a large screen in there to help you in that regard. In closing, let me remind you that it's important that you follow the law as spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case, and even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, 
you must apply them and use them. For two centuries, we have all lived by the Constitution and the law, and no juror has the right to violate the rules that we all share. Uh, I have three alternates um, that I need to uh, speak with. Um, so what I'm going to do first is have my three alternates. Sure. It, the attorneys brought to my attention that I skipped a part of the instruction, and I did. Um, and so when you have it in there, you'll see it. It's a part about your ability to, to have communication devices, phones, iPads, uh, things of that nature. You haven't had them uh, basically throughout your sequestration. You're not going to have them in the jury room. I'm not going to all of a sudden give you your phones to use. So I kind of skipped over that. Um, because communication with the outside world is not an issue. It hasn't been an issue, and it, it, it won't continue to be an issue. I will say this, um, that if you all have a break at some point in time, you should not deliberate without all 12 of you being in the jury room, obviously. But uh, And if you're on a break, clearly you're not to communicate with anybody nor let anybody communicate with you. Um, but that part of the instruction deals with communication devices and you don't have any, so uh, that's kind of why I skipped it. I should have told them that's that's, that's my custom. I kind of skip over it when I, in a, in a normal situation uh, where a jury has not been sequestered and maybe they've been able to have their phones with them, uh, at the time I send them into the jury room, we take their phones from them and we put them in a basket and we watch over them until uh, they've concluded their, their deliberations, but obviously you haven't had your phone, so. Um, Hopefully that explains that to them. My fault, I should have explained it to them. Uh, so I need to speak to the alternates, and that would be jurors number 14, 15, and 16. Uh, if I can have 15 and 16 in my courtroom 305, and 14 I need in my jury room in courtroom 305, uh, I will speak to you folks a little bit more detail. I'm going to let you now go back into the jury room to get any belongings that you may have in the jury room. Uh, that's to the, the sets of jury instructions that I've got. I've just got a set of jury instructions for you. Uh, Keep in mind, though, that um, at the end of the day, only one verdict form has to be checked, signed, and dated, and that's done by the foreperson. So when you've reached a verdict, uh, what will happen is we'll, we'll bring you back into, you folks can go ahead. Um, when, we, when you've reached a verdict, we'll bring you back into the courtroom. The foreperson just needs to fold the verdict form over, hand it to the bailiff, the bailiff will then hand it to me. I will check it to make sure it's in accurate, uh, it's in proper form and, and accurately filled out. Uh, and then the clerk will uh, publish the verdict. So that's how that works at the end. So we'll just take a second to allow them to get their, their items and then uh, we'll allow you to step into the jury room. And you can obviously take your notes with you. And uh, if I can give this to the bailiff, these are copies of the jury instructions to And that's 12. That way each one of you will have a copy to look at if you uh, need so. They ready? And again, ladies and gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough for your time and attention, obviously since, obviously since last Monday. And um, thank you for your hard work so far and your continued uh, uh, service and hard work while you're deliberating.
All right, any exceptions or objections other than, I guess, the one little one there uh, yes. about the communication from the state as to the instructions as read? Uh, no, sir. From the defense? No, sir. All right. Um, all right, then, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be um, in recess until we hear from uh, the jury.